Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just have to echo those sentiments. Um, the choir was amazing. Can we give them a round of applause? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am honored and elated to be here. Uh, truly excited to hopefully share some of my experience and knowledge with all of you. Um, I'm no stranger to this state. Uh, my lovely wife is here, Latoya Legrand, roll now. Uh, we just got married um, about a month or so ago, and she's a pediatric dentist uh, at UAB. And so I just wanted to have her stand. And be up and Really when it's fresh, still feels good though. Still feels good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, honored to just have this, this wonderful chance to, uh, to speak with you, to have this moment uh, where we can um, interact and I can tell you a little bit about my story. Um, you know, I'm just also thrilled to be in a place where I admire so many people who serve our country so diligently and so loyally. It's, um, it makes uh, you know, this kind of experience, this kind of gathering, this magnanimous event, even that much more impactful when you're doing it around and with people who serve our country so greatly. So can we give the men and women who serve our country? I'd like from the outset, I like to start all of my, my, my talks by um, asking someone here, challenging someone here to get 2% better. 2% uh, of growth, 2% of increase from my story, anything that you can grab from what I say today, I want you to add it to your own journey and hopefully help you get a change in your trajectory. Uh, get to your goals, get to your visions, get to your dreams. Grab 2% to become a better leader, a thinker, a better brother, father, son, philanthropist, whatever it is, whatever 2% you can grab, I hope that is the goal today because my football coach at Florida State University, his name is Mickey Andrews, from Ozark, Alabama, actually, and he would challenge all of us, all of his student athletes, to get 2% better every single day on the football field, whether it be with our stamina, the way we attacked receivers off the line of scrimmage, our blitz packages, the way we caught the ball, anything, he would challenge us to get 2% better, a practical, tangible, real-life goal of daily improvement. And he put it on our board in our meeting room to make sure that we we're held accountable that, hey, did we get better today? Did we improve? And I, I've extrapolated that ideology into life so that anything that I do and anything that I challenge my mentees to do or my patients to do at Mass General Hospital, I just try to help them get 2% better, 2% of growth, 2% of edification because those small steps every single day will add up at the end of the day where you see yourself being um, much better than you were, making incredible progress. So that's my goal. So ladies and gentlemen, my story starts in the Bahamas, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Small country, best island nation in the world, I will say, I'm biased, but it is a great place. My parents uh, were born and raised there, met when they were eight years old, started dating at 15 and married at 21. They had my four older brothers in the Bahamas, and my mother was seven months pregnant with me in Nassau, but wanted me to be a U.S. and a Bahamian citizen, so she got permission from her doctor to fly to Houston, Texas, have me there, where she had a couple friends from high school. As so soon as I was able to fly, we went back to Nassau, Bahamas, and I spent the first three years of my life there. Eventually, my dad took a job in New York City, and we moved up to New Jersey, and I lived right outside of Atlantic City, New Jersey, and that's where I spent the majority of my formative years. My parents, when coming to America, they made sure that me and my brothers were hardwired with this message, that we left the Bahamas, we left paradise, we left family, sunshine, beach, familiarity, culture, to start over in a new country where we don't know anybody or know anything, and people don't know us that well, so that we could achieve our goals, so we could maximize our ability and fulfill our potential. If we developed a firm foundation of education, if we stayed true to our Christian principles, and if we respected our elders and respected our authority, that there was no ceiling on our growth in America. They believed that the United States was a place that had an abundance of resources and ample opportunity for anyone, immigrants coming from a small, poor country like the Bahamas, to come to America and to do big things. They hardwired that into our minds. They impressed that on us all the time. My four older brothers, they understood that message quite well. They got it. They were good kids. They were good citizens. They were good students. But me, as a baby, I, it didn't catch me too soon. Uh, you know, I was um, a good athlete my whole life. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I, I played well on the football field. I'd score five touchdowns on the field, best player on my team, best, best player in the town. And I was a really good student, too. I got straight A's. I competed in the classroom. But my academic success and my athletic prowess 
Those were the two things that were sort of highlighted as a young person, but my behavior didn't match those two things. My behavior was untoward. My behavior was one of which I said, if I'm getting straight A's and I'm scoring a bunch of touchdowns, and I can act like how I want to act. I don't have to listen to anybody, right? This was, I had this invisible cloak on me that said I could do whatever I wanted to do. And so what that led, honestly, I mean, you heard the introduction. Uh, I'm a Rhodes Scholar, neurosurgeon, like all these things that are happening now, you wouldn't believe that when I was younger, I used to steal from our local convenience stores. I used to skip school. I used to get suspended all the time for talking back to teachers or fighting. The big thing for me was fighting. I had a bit of a temper. And if you said three things that triggered me, I put on my best Floyd Mayweather impersonation and just get at it. It was, it, was, I was, it was serious. I mean, the three things were if you called me a racial epithet, if you talked about my small country, the Bahamas, and if you talked bad about my mother. Now, I love my father as well, but my mother, I'm a mama's boy, so if you said something about that, it was a problem. So one day, this one young man, white kid, who uh, you know I didn't quite get along with on the bus, he called me the N-word and called my mother the B-word. So that's two out of the three triggers right there. <laughs> I said, okay, we got to solve this with my hands. So I, uh, I went and beat him up, and his injuries were so bad that he had to go to the hospital uh, to be treated. And um, his parents came knocking on our door, and they said, Mr. or Mrs. Roll, we're taking your son to court. And so they took me to court. And I'm standing there in Atlantic City, New Jersey, as an 11-year-old boy with a suit on like this, standing in front of this judge and trying to tell him why I did what I did and why I was remorseful for what I did. And, it was very tough and taxing on my own family to put them in this precarious and this embarrassing situation. I remember distinctly turning back around and seeing my father and my mother in the back of that courthouse looking distraught, looking embarrassed that their last child, my mother called me her last pain, her last pain <laughs> would put them in that situation. You know, we left the Bahamas. Our, our, our cousins and my aunts, uncles and grandparents, they couldn't afford to get to America. And here I am in America, with my brothers, with my parents, with this great chance to do great things, and I'm blowing it by acting a fool, by, by just a terrible behavior, by having an attitude, by fighting all the time. And here I am in court, may change the whole trajectory of my life if things go wrong. But thankfully, by the grace of God, thankfully for a wonderful lawyer, and maybe just fatigue from that kid's family from going to court over and over again, everything was dropped, and I walked out of that courthouse in Atlantic City with no blemish on my record, and it was unbelievable. And that day, ladies and gentlemen, that day, as an 11-year-old young man, a Bahamian American, in New Jersey, in that courthouse in Atlantic City, that day, I truly believe that I made the pivot, I made the turn from suspensions and stealing and skipping school and this untoward behavior, and I made the turn towards the things that will lead me to hopefully be successful in this country. I made the turn towards getting involved in extracurricular activities. I played the saxophone in my jazz band. I played that saxophone in our nursing homes around Atlantic City, around our local community. I volunteered for Habitat for Humanity and built homes in Circleville, West Virginia, and Wakulla, Florida. I joined our debate team, our think team. I was editor of our newspaper. I played Tevya in Phil on the Roof. I was a white Russian Jewish milkman with five white daughters. <laughs> I, did, I did it all. I was like, man, let's just go for it. I was going in. I was going in because I wanted to be different. I wanted to change my life from what I used to do to now what I should be doing. And I gave my life to Christ that year as well. Amen. Gave my life to Christ and I said, and I, I didn't become sin free that day, obviously, right? We all fall short of the glory of God. But I believe that day, uh, my decisions were more deliberate and they were colored and, and ordered by God's word and, and his love for us. So that, that changed things for me. And I continued that momentum on through high school. My freshman year of high school, I ended up getting an offer from the University of Oklahoma. Oklahoma was the number one team in the country at the time. A week later, Purdue, then Notre Dame, SC, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, Michigan, all the schools, as you heard in the introduction, end up with 83 offers from my junior year and became the number one ranked player in ESPN and ultimately decided to go to Florida State University for a couple of reasons. Uh, first reason was they had a head coach, Bobby Bowden, also from Alabama. Uh, who I knew he wasn't going to jet and leave once I got to Florida State. He wasn't going to go to the NFL. He was going to stay there. He was a godfather kind of figure, grandfather kind of guy, Christian. My parents loved him. They felt secure sending me to Tallahassee, Florida to be with him. The second reason I chose Florida State University was because I got along with the players. Even though I was a prep school kid from New Jersey, Bahamian, 
eating crack kung, bull kung, stew kung, fried kung, kung, spreaders, kung, snack. Even though I was eating different and talking differently, my teammates were having dreadlocks and gold teeth and saying words like jit and eating country fried steak. I had no idea what that was. Even though they were a little bit different than me, I loved those guys and they seemed really cool and I can get along with them even off the field. And the third reason I went to Florida State, and this is the real reason, I'm here to be very honest with you. The third reason I went to Florida State was because if I went to Stanford or Duke or Notre Dame or Northwestern, I'd have been another smart football player, right? But if I went to Florida State, I'd have been the smart football player. <laughs> And they would pump me up and put me on billboards and have me in front of boosters and have me on commercials and they did that. They were like, Myron, you're a football player who can speak. Come on. <laughs> so it was great. I mean my freshman year I was meeting all kinds of people. The governor, Jeb Bush, Charlie Curtis, I was all over the place. And uh, eventually they pushed me to apply for the Rhodes Scholarship, which is the highest academic award that any college student can earn. Typically it doesn't go to a jock like myself. The last one, major one to win a Rhodes Scholarship was Pat Hayden, played quarterback at SC, and then Bill Bradley, some of you may have heard of him, obviously, senator from New Jersey. Cory Booker just dropped out of the presidential race. He was a Rhodes Scholar, played football at Stanford. But you have all these great people, General Wesley Clark and Pete Dawkins and Bill Clinton, Rachel Maddow, Susan Rice. All these wonderful people win Rhodes Scholarships, and I had this chance to go to Oxford and earn a master's degree in medical anthropology. But at the same time that Oxford experience came, I was really doing well on the football field. And I put my name into the scouting service that's approved by the NCAA to see where I may potentially get drafted. And uh, it said that I would be a first or second round draft pick. Now, I went to Florida State because my cousin Samari Roll played at Florida State and I just, I, I wanted to be an NFL player. And, and this was a place that pumped out these primetime Deion Sanders, these great athletes, right? And so here's my chance. I'm on the precipice of fulfilling this lifelong dream of being an NFL player. But Oxford was either you take it now or you don't, get, you don't get it. So it was a very tough decision to make. Oxford or the NFL? NFL or Oxford? I asked a lot of my friends, my classmates, my teammates, people I met at Waffle House. I was like, <laughs> what, what, what would you do if you were me? Would you go to Oxford or the NFL? Honestly, the majority of people said go to the NFL. They said go to the NFL right now. Because it's such a fleeting and transient opportunity for you to play professional football. Your skills aren't gonna be there forever. You don't, you're not young forever. You might as well take it. You're hot right now. They want you. Go in, get your money. You can always buy your education back to Oxford after you're done. <laughs> and then a small minority of people said, Myron, go to Oxford, go to England. You've always placed a premium on education. You've always placed um, more emphasis and more impact on the word student than athlete. Go to England, get your degree. The NFL will still be there. Stay in shape and come back and see what you can do after you're stuck. So I prayed about this decision. I thought introspectively about this decision. I, it was very tough. It was a hard one to make. Eventually, I chose to go to England. I went to Oxford, said no to the NFL, said no to the $6 million guarantee that would have happened in the signing bonus getting drafted in the first or second round. Went to England, got that degree, endured some terrible weather, ate fish and chips, <laughs> played a little rugby, tried to stay in shape as best I could, uh, traveled a lot. It was great. Had a wonderful time doing that. Built some great relationships and some great friendships. Came back to this state actually, and played in the Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama. Did very well there, got my name back on the radar of NFL scouts. But ended up getting drafted in the sixth round instead of the second or the first. I made $70,000 guaranteed instead of six million. I was the 52nd man on the roster instead of the 23rd. I played three years in the NFL instead of eight or nine, which was projected. So there certainly was a sacrifice uh, athletically to make that choice. But if you ask me, Myron, would you make that choice again? today, tomorrow, the day after, and the day after, I would make the same decision. And I'd make that decision because, honestly, it put me in a position where young people who look at my story, who see a young man who maybe they could relate to, who they can see themselves in, they say, you know what? He chose education over athletics. He chose education and knowledge and power over fast money, that limelight, that lifestyle of being an NFL player. He chose knowledge which will endure and last him long, and hopefully I was able to draw help people draw inspiration from that so they can move towards their goals and their dreams. You want to have people kind of see themselves in you. When I was younger, my dad used to have me read books on Paul Robeson, Nelson Mandela, Kofi Annan, Ben Carson, Malcolm X, W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, these wonderful figures, these wonderful men who looked like me. So he wanted me to see myself in their journey, see how they use their leadership and use their knowledge and use their skills to galvanize a massive amount of people towards one common objective. 
And if me choosing Oxford and education and the Rhodes Scholarship over the NFL could put me in a position to do that for someone else, a name that I know or a name that I don't know, then I'd be living a purpose-filled life. And, and that was real. I've gotten um, text messages and calls and social media correspondence from young people who said, Myron, I put your picture on my wall because you are the example of someone who puts student before athlete. And that's a big deal for me. And that, that was really powerful, and, and, I, and I appreciated that. And I tell you that story, not for self-aggrandizement, honestly. I tell you that story because here's at the point in this talk where I want to I want to park and say, you know, in life, there's going to be moments where you make difficult decisions, where you come to a road, where you come to an intersection, where sometimes you may have to go left or go right. You may have to go up or down. You may have to choose this or that. I implore you. I implore you or maybe the people that you mentor or maybe the kids that look up to you or maybe your family members or anyone else that you're in touch with, I implore you and those folks to make the decision that not only benefits you and behooves your future interests, but also brings other people along with you. Because that's what I think that decision did. It not only helped me get to Oxford and get my degree and, and do wonderful things there, but it also motivated other people to move and keep that drive going so they can go farther, make more progress, make a difference, make an indelible impact in this world in their own right, in their own fashion. Make the decision that not only benefits you, but other people with you. A rising tide certainly lifts all boats. Once we all get through, once we all start pounding away, we can all break through that door to get us into that theater to become players on the world stage. That door has been chained, that door has been locked, that door has been prohibited by for people who may look like you or may come from where you come from or, or, or you know, may have your family lineage or may talk the way you talk, but if we make those decisions every single day, we get 2% better every single day, we make the decisions that are right, make the decisions that benefit you and others, it allows you to bust through that door. It allows you to get other people through that door. So more people have a chance of success. Not everyone's gonna get it, but at least they have an opportunity to do so. And once we get through that door and get into that theater, it's time to get on that stage and become a player like William Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon once said. It's not just enough to bust through that door and get in. Now we have to do something about it when we get there. And I'll end with this quickly because I know my time's running up. So how do we get on the stage and maintain ourselves as players, as impact people in this world, in our community or in the world around us? First way is find your passion and do big things with it. Find your passion, know what you're passionate about, find the thing that lights you up, that gets you on fire. For me, it's medicine in vulnerable populations. As a neurosurgeon, I'm able to take uh, take care of some people who are sick, who have no other option, who come to you and say, you know what, I have this tumor, I have this disc, I have this aneurysm, I need help. I need you to do something about it. You're able to take care of these vulnerable populations. It fires me up to want to serve and to, 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 to decrease this health disparity gap that we have in America and around the world, even back home in the Bahamas. That fires me up. That's the passion. I think that people who are passionate about something, who are fired up about something, it's very difficult to stop them. Very hard. It almost takes an act of Mother Nature to stop someone. They might be told no, they might be told maybe, they might be told not yet, they may be told slow down, but if you are fired up and passionate about something, you will keep busting through and you will keep going. The second thing is load. You gotta load yourself. Load yourself and get yourself ready with the requisite skills, knowledge, information, and experiences so that when people say, why are you doing healthcare in Uganda? Why are you going to close myeloma and angocele spina bifida kids in Uganda? Why are you going to shut these kids who have hydrocephalus because they have infectious disease uh, rampant in their low income and poor resource country? Well, I'm doing it because of this, 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 and this. Boom, able to rattle it out right away because I know it, because I feel it, because I live it, because I breathe it. You gotta load yourself. Find your passion, load yourself, and the last thing you need to do to maintain yourself into this world stage or into your local stage to be a player, to make a real impact, is to mobilize, to get going. Latoya and I, we live in a generation right now, our peers, where it's all hashtag everything, right? It's like, oh, we can sit on Twitter, we can sit on Instagram, and we can tell everyone else what to do with the problem, and we conceptualize or maybe theorize what to do, but we don't actually go out and do it. We wait for someone else to get to do it. But why not you, and why not us? Why not the people you mentor? Why not the, your mentees? Why, why not us in this room? And why not the people who are here right now? Why not the people in our generation saying, we can mobilize and get something done? It's not enough to sit on the sideline and be a spectator or be a boundary observer. We gotta get active, we gotta get going. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm just honored to be here. I really am. I had a couple, couple surgeries that I had put off today. Uh, yesterday I worked on a six month old kid with uh, a little scalp lesion and we were able to take it out, do brain surgery on her and she went home today. I got the message and it just, it's, it's an honor to be here. 
you know, to tell you my story, to tell you where I started from, from the Bahamas to New Jersey, to getting in fights and not being the, the, the greatest youth, to making that pivot, that change towards good things so that hopefully one day I can make good decisions and go to Florida State, go to Oxford, get back to the NFL, be a neurosurgeon right now at Harvard at Mass General Hospital, and then hopefully help somebody bust through the door, get into that theater, get on a stage, stay on the stage by finding that passion, loading up your body with what you need to do it, and then mobilize into action. I think it's possible. I think Dr. King was really trying to have us do this by his speeches, by his work, by his lifelong legacy of, of doing good, regardless of who we are, where we come from, what we look like, what our names are. He had that for us. And now we're sort of living in that, in, in that age where it's possible for us to be great. It's possible for us to have success. But there's things that we need to do every single day to get 2% better, to move towards that. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your attention.